Hey guys, Dr. Ash back. We are going to talk about chest tubes and I promise this is going to be short and sweet, but if chest tubes have got you down or got you confused or you're worried at all, this is going to be the perfect video for you. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, what is the purpose of a chest tube? The purpose of a chest tube is to return negative pressure. We always want some sort of negative pressure within the chest wall or the chest cavity or the intrapleural space. Um, and a lot of people get confused as to where the chest tube is inserted. It is actually not inserted into the lung itself. If you look at the top of this picture right here, you can see that the lung is here. And then this is the intra pleural space. So this is the space actually surrounding the lung. And the whole purpose of a chest tube is either to drain air or to drain fluid. And your placement of your chest tube is really going to depend on the issue. Do we have an air problem or do we have a fluid problem? And so I want you to think about this logically. Air tends to rise. Okay, so air goes up so we would anticipate a higher entry level, such as this one seen up here, we would anticipate a higher insertion site for air, whereas fluid is heavy. So it tends to go to the bottom of that pleural space, okay? And if it's at the bottom of that pleural space, we would anticipate the drain being inserted towards the bottom of that pleural space. So if my anticipation is to drain air, I'm going to go up. If my anticipation is to drain fluid, I'm going to go down. So just remember, air rises, fluid drops, okay? One of the reasons why we put in a chest tube is something called tension pneumothorax. And again, that's where that pressure increases in the chest cavity. Well, what happens when we put too much pressure on the chest cavity it puts pressure on that lung and then that lung moves over and puts pressure on the heart, which is no bueno for circulation. So if you want to review circulation, we've got a whole series on perfusion and that kind of information, but this is kind of to prevent before we get to any cardiac complications. And so we have three classic symptoms of attention pneumothorax, okay? Tachycardia and hypotension, again, those are going to be some more of those later signs as the pneumothorax continues to spread towards the heart. But the first three things you're going to look for as a nurse is what's called a media, mediastinal shift. And that's where the trachea actually gets pushed over. So if I have a left-sided pneumothorax, that trachea is going to push over to the right because there's so much pressure on the left side that everything shifts over to the right, okay? So tracheal deviation. We know from normal health assessment that the trachea should be midline. You will actually see it move over to the side, and it's really kind of freaky. Of course, on the affected side, we would have decreased breath sounds because, again, we have that tension or that pressure in that chest cavity so that lung cannot expand as it should. Again, going back to the left-sided example, my left side would have decreased breath sounds. Um, and then the other thing is something called subcutaneous emphysema. And this is where air gets trapped under the skin. And that's just all it is, subcutaneous emphysema. And so basically that's going to happen. It says around the insertion site. This can also be like if there's a puncture wound, um, if there was blunt trauma to the chest. So it's either going to be located around that area or it's going to be above because remember air rises. So you can actually get subcutaneous emphysema up into the neck area. So again, those are the three classic things that we need to look for. Tachycardia, hypotension, again, those are kind of later signs, okay? The other thing with tension pneumothorax, because we are in the chest tube section, is that if your chest tube becomes clogged or kinked or um, dislodged in any way, shape, or form, you can actually see your patient develop signs of pneumothorax. It just depends on um, the severity. So let's take a look at the two drainage systems. And we have something called a wet seal and a dry seal. And what you'll see on the left over here is a classic wet seal. And what you'll see over here is a classic dry seal. And here is the difference, okay? If you'll notice to the very left of both of these chambers, one has water. You see this blue water is filled up. 
and this one has a dial. Okay, that is the difference. They both still have what's called a water seal chamber, which is located here as B and C, B and C. Okay, that's still the water seal chamber, which is going to be important here in just a second but this is a dry system and this is a wet system. And we're gonna compare the two here in just a second, just so you kind of know the difference between the two. What you'll see over here on the right side is what we call graduated or marked areas. And this is how you measure your drainage of your chest tube, all right? This down here is clamping it off in case you have to, um, in case you get an order to clamp it off, um, there's another way to clamp it if it becomes dislodged or broken, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. And this is the connector that actually plugs into the chest tube that gets inserted into your patient. So it's actually two parts. We have the chest tube that goes into the patient, and then we have the drainage system which gets connected to the patient. So let's talk about that wet versus dry. And so on the left are your wet kind of information versus your dry information on the right. And so in the wet, and I'm just gonna go back for just a second, the tip of the chest tube, okay, the catheter. So the chest tube connected to your patient, connects here to the device, goes into this chamber, okay? The tip of the catheter within this drainage system actually sits below the level of the water and you can see it kind of hanging out right through there, whereas the dry does not have that, okay? wet, the catheter tip is in there, dry does not have that option. And basically that prevents air from going into the lung, right? We're trying to drain air, we're trying to drain fluid. And if we put that tube, if the tip of the tube is just hanging out in a dry system, it's most likely going to put air back in. So air might get sucked into the lung. I can tell you in my 22 plus years in the healthcare profession, I have only ever used wet. So I think wet is preferred. That's usually what your questions are about, but you just have to realize that there is a wet versus dry system. All right, um, this wet system allows outflow of air and fluid, so it can work with both types of accumulation, whether it be air or fluid. The water will uh, fluctuate. It moves up and down every time a patient inhales and exhales. That is completely normal. Gentle bubbling in the chamber is normal when we have like rolling bubbles and it's just continuous and over and over and over, it just keeps bubbling. And it's, it's almost like a pot of water that's boiling too hard. That usually indicates that there's a leak in your chest tube system, whether it's up at the insertion site, at the connection port, or there could be a break in the drainage system itself. And so our water level determines how much suction is happening to allow that air and that fluid to come out. On the dry side, we're gonna use wall suction. There is a knob to control the suction and an orange floater. There is no bubbling when it comes to the dry system. Here is the orange floater that I just talked about right here in this chamber. I believe that's an E chamber. Yep, A, B, C, D, and E. So that's your orange floater. This right here is your dial for how much pressure you are titrating your system to, and that's gonna come from your provider. That is nothing we were gonna, um, nursing school will ask you about. That's nothing that the NCLEX will ask you about. Let's talk about the collection chamber for just a second. That's that graduated side that I talked about that has the markings on it. So you know how much drainage is in there. We always wanna assess the drainage, right? We're nurses or gonna be nurses very soon. So we always wanna look at the color, the volume. General rule of thumb, if I have greater than 70 milliliters, I have a sudden increase, which means, you know, I've been measuring it every two hours. Um, the drainage has been like 10 mLs every two hours. And then all of a sudden, 150 comes out. That is a sudden increase. That would be a cause for you to contact the provider. And then of course, if the drainage turns bloody, it should always be that serous yellow color. It should never be full on blood coming out of the chest. And so that's gonna be your opportune time to notify the provider. 
marking the drainage, I say it's, it's just like I's and O's, right? You're going to put it in the O's because it's an output. And I would say mark the drainage about every one to four hours in the ICU setting, which is where I come from. It's every two hours with your I's and O's, um, but I definitely wouldn't let it go more than every four hours. Now we talk about the water seal chamber. This is going to be in any system. It's going to be in the dry or the wet system. And basically that just helps to monitor fluid fluctuations. Okay, if the fluid fluctuations stop, that either means your system is occluded. So it's like kinked off somewhere. Your suction isn't working. So you got to check the wall suction or the lung has re-expanded and the patient is good to go. The majority of the time, your chest tube patients are going to have daily x-rays anyways, so they can chest x-rays so they can follow the progress of the chest tube. Um, and so once the lung has re-expanded, you'll probably get an order at that point to clamp it just to see what happens to the x-ray the next morning. And again, that would be your time to really do that assessment for that tension pneumothorax. Well, I will also tell you that if your patient is being treated for a pneumothorax, we expect there to be bubbling within that chamber and not continuous rolling boil. The water is boiling on the pot, on the stove, but we're talking about intermittent bubbling. So you see a bubble here or there, that's completely normal. But again, anything that's a continuous rolling bubbling um, indicates that there's a leak and we got to contact the provider or figure out where the leak is at. So we got just a few more considerations before we wrap up this little talk on chest tubes. We want to make sure that there's an occlusive sterile dressing taped at the insertion site always. We never leave that catheter that's inserted into the chest cavity. That is not open to air. That is an occlusive sterile dressing. Um, an x-ray is always used to confirm placement of that chest tube as well as lung re-expansion. Okay, I can go ahead and tell you, I have an absolute horror story from the ICU. I actually had a resident put a chest tube in the liver. Um, he meant to drain fluid from the right lung and it ended up in the liver. And he couldn't understand why the patient wasn't getting any better. And I'm like, probably because it's not in the right spot. But the x-ray confirmed that and we had to do it all over again. You want to make sure as the nurse, you're always assessing that respiratory status and those lung sounds. Again, that's going to be your first indication that maybe a tension pneumothorax is forming. Um, the chest tube is not performing like it should. The patient may be in distress or it could be that the patient is improving. We always want to keep that drainage system below the level of the chest. We want gravity to kind of drain that chest. We want to make sure that all connections are secured and taped. Remember I showed you there's a port to the drainage system that connects into the physical chest tube that's inside of your patient. That connection should be secured. We typically um, will clamp it to the bed so we know that it's not going to get pulled out whenever we're working with our patient and it has to be taped. And so what this does is it helps prevent a leak, it helps keep the system intact, and it helps keep from pulling on the catheters or the the tube itself. We want to encourage our patients to cough and deep breathe if, if at all possible. My patients were in the ICU, so we didn't have that luxury. We had them on ventilators, but you will see a chest tube on the general floors, um, med surge floors, surgical floors, just depending on where the patient is at. And we want to encourage them to cough and deep breathe. Now, as you can imagine, having a chest inside of your chest cavity can be quite painful. So one of the things that we encourage is to actually administer pain medications, and then we encourage that cough and deep breathing because we really have got to get that lung re-expanded. Also position changes. You shouldn't leave the patient just supine or just on the left side or just on the right side. You wanna make sure you're moving them so you can expand and oxygenate both lungs. For emergency purposes, there should always be a clamp a sterile occlusive dressing at the bedside and a bottle of sterile water, which I'm gonna get into the sterile water here in just a second. But the clamp is there because if the chest tube becomes disconnected at that port where it goes from the drainage system into the chest, we have to clamp at the chest side because what's gonna happen is if that becomes dislodged or that becomes unconnected, air is gonna suck into that pleural cavity. So clamps, 
always at the bedside, sterile occlusive dressing at the bedside, and we're going to talk about that right now. If the system breaks or cracks, so this is the drainage system that I've connected to the chest tube, we're going to insert the end of that tube, the chest tube coming from the patient into a bottle of sterile water, and then we're going to replace the whole system. Okay, if you let that chest tube just kind of hang out, it's going to not be sterile. You're going to introduce infection into your patient's pleural cavity and probably kill them. Okay, so make sure if the system, the drainage system itself, where the water seal and the drainage goes, if that cracks, we have to replace it. But we need to make sure the chest tube from the patient is sitting in sterile water. Okay. If the patient is going to have the chest tube removed because, hey, they got better and they're good to go, we want them to take a deep breath, hold the breath, release, bear down that valsalva maneuver as they remove the chest tube. And that just helps keep the pressure equalized within the chest and it keeps air from sucking back into that pleural space that we just fixed. Okay. And then lastly, if the chest tube dislodges, what we want to try to do is pinch the opening of the skin together so there will be an incision where the chest tube is inserted. Typically it's sutured in place, but sometimes they dislodge on accident. We're going to pinch that opening of the skin together. We're going to slap that occlusive sterile dressing over that site because, again, we don't want air sucking into that area. And then we're calling the provider immediately. Okay, and that's it on chest tubes. Everybody's worried about chest tubes, um, but those are your main points. And let me know if you have any questions. Make sure you like, share, comment, all that fun stuff, and subscribe to the channel if you like your content. See you in the next one.